Hey, good morning and welcome to Christ Church. My name is Mike Skunas. I'm one of the vicars or pastors in training on staff. I'm so thankful that you've come to join us from wherever you are, from your living room, from your couch, from your desk, wherever it is that you're joining us this morning. We are thankful that you are here to worship. And we are excited that on August 2nd, we're going to resume Sunday morning in-person services. And we can't wait to see you uh, see you then. Um, so for now, we ask you to join us in song and worship and praises to our Lord and Savior. Um, the band's going to come on in just a second and sing, and the lyrics are going to be at the bottom of your screen, so we hope you sing along.
right now and I love that it's just a proclamation of truth that we are children of God we have nothing to fear um, and there's something so powerful about that so please join us in singing you unravel me with a melody you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave fear I am a child of God From my mother's womb you have chosen me Excuse me, so I can stand and sleep. 
God, we give you thanks that we no longer need to be slaves to fear because we are your children, that you are our light and our salvation. God, we need you in the world in this moment and in every moment. God, especially as people are still getting sick and dying, we ask that you be with those who are recovering and those that are yet to get sick. Continue to protect uh, all of our medical professionals and our first responders, all of our caregivers who are being your hands and feet in this world and bringing the love and grace and mercy that you desire for us um, into our lives and into our communities. God, we ask that as we learn more about what it means to pray big, bold prayers to you and to build that relationship with you, God, we ask that you speak to us, that you make your will known, and that you continue to speak to us through other people and through the words that we read in the Bible. God, we lift all these things up to you in your name. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome to Christ Church. Again, my name is Mike Skunis. I am one of the vicars or pastors in training on staff, and I'm so thankful that you have decided to join us for worship this morning. We are going to pause just for a second right now to collect our tithes and offerings. And if this is the first time that you've ever uh, tuned into one of our services, we say thank you, welcome. We never ask any of our first-time guests to give. But if you are one of our longtime members, our covenant members, our regular attenders, you know that we stress God's radical generosity, that God has been radically generous with us, and he uses our generosity to impact our communities and our world. And so we invite you to continue to partner with us with your tithes and your gifts, and we give thanks for the ways that you have already made a difference in the world. So if you want to give online, there's a link. Um, at the graphic right above, um, that you can follow that link to give online, or you can mail it in, or hopefully we'll see you soon enough in person, and there will be boxes to drop your offerings there. So thank you for being a radically generous congregation. One of the things that we really value at Christ Church is community, that even while we are still socially distanced and as we're still trying to figure out how to come back as a world, try to get together, we still want to be a people who is in prayer for one another. And one of the ways that we can do that, that we've been doing during this entire time um, since lockdowns and quarantine started happening, is that we've been texting neighbors and friends and family. So specifically, I ask you to join me this morning as you text somebody. Think about somebody that you maybe haven't talked to for a while, that maybe you haven't seen for a while because of COVID, um, and I invite you to text them and ask them, how can I be praying for you? So again, text somebody you haven't seen for a while, you haven't talked to for a while, and text them, how can I be praying for you? I'm going to do that right now, and so I invite you to do that now at home. Thanks for partnering with us and doing God's work and continuing to be in prayer for people. Uh, I would invite you now to watch our bumper video as we get into week three of our series, Ancient Prayers. Hey, good morning, Christ Church. I'm Pastor Bob, lead pastor here at Christ Church. It is fantastic 
uh, to be with you this morning, uh, to be able to worship together, get in the Word together, and uh, obviously with this series to be able to pray together. Uh, we're in a series called uh, Ancient Prayers, and remember what we're doing in this series for the summer now is uh, we're going back into the Old Testament, and we're looking at the prayers of some of God's people that were just uh, powerful prayers uh, in their time and in their life experience. And uh, we're trying to look at those prayers and be able to kind of glean some ideas and principles and practices from those prayers and apply them into our lives in our time uh, as we're still uh, God's people. And so today we're going to do that, uh, and we're going to look at the experience and the prayers uh, of a guy named David. He happened to be King David. And uh, King David was one of uh, the most, if not the most significant king uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, and uh, we're going to slice into 2 Samuel 7 here and uh, look at what's going on in his life experience and then get to uh, one of his most powerful prayers. So what's going on? Well, David now is really uh, king. And uh, what that means is David has now uh, been able to subdue all his enemies. Uh, the previous king, Saul, uh, has died. Uh, his family is no longer a threat to David. And so David has begin, uh, begun securing his position uh, on the throne. One of the big things uh, that's taken place is David has now been confirmed by both northern Israel and southern Israel as the unifying uh, king. He's uh, managed to go through kind of a civil war to be able to accomplish it, but he's emerged now uh, as the king of all Israel. And to solidify that, to kind of confirm that, uh, he's taken a dramatic step of making Jerusalem the capital city, uh, and he has brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. And the Ark of the Covenant uh, is that holy box that is kind of that, that symbol of God's presence and symbol of God's uh, power. And so David now has really solidified uh, the throne. And we kind, of, we kind of come into this place in his life where he's solidified that throne. Uh, and it tells us in 2 Samuel that he's experiencing one of those rare moments of uh, being able to sit back and say, uh, this is good, what's next? It says, when King David was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all the surrounding uh, enemies. So David now is solidified. He's sitting back. He's in the palace. Uh, things are good. You know, when that happens, uh, as rare that may seem in many of our lives, when that happens, uh, I mean, what, what, do you, what do you find yourself doing? Where do you find your mind uh, going? I don't know about you. But uh, when I have those, those moments where I kind of can able to sit back, things are going well, uh, you know, I begin to dream. I begin to think and dream and plan. I, I get ideas. Well, the same is true for David. David is there. He's sitting back on the throne. Things are going pretty well. And he begins to think. He begins to dream. And David gets an idea. He gets an incredible idea. Now, what do you do when you get an incredible idea? When, when you're a follower of Christ, when you're a person of God, what do you do when you get an incredible idea? Well, David, David, Scripture tells us, is a man after God's own heart. And so what's his first step? He gets this great idea, and he summons Nathan the prophet. That is what you do. Notice David does the right thing. He gets this great idea, and his first reaction is to say, wait, I need to make sure that this is not just my idea, but this is a good God idea. And so he summons Nathan the prophet. Now, Nathan the prophet appears uh, in the Old Testament 35 times. And of those times, 16 of those times, he's specifically referred to as Nathan the prophet. And so we can see what his role is. He, he's not a guy who does any miracles. He is a guy who speaks for the Lord. He is kind of God's representative, and he, he speaks truth into the lives of David the king and then ultimately David's son Solomon, who becomes king. But his role, 
specifically is to be that representative of God and be able to speak into kings' lives. And, of course, into the lives of all those uh, in Israel. So David gets a great idea. And so he summons Nathan and wants to consult with him. And in so doing, to consult with the Lord about his idea and plan. What's the idea and plan? David says, look, I'm living here in a beautiful cedar palace, but the ark of God is out there in a tent. What's the idea? David looks at himself. He looks at his life experience. He looks at the radical generosity that God has given him, and he says, you know what? This isn't right. I'm sitting here in a palace, and God is still out here in a tent. That's not good. God deserves better. And so David says, I'm going to do better. I'm going to do a great thing. I got a great plan, a great idea. I'm going to build a temple for God. I'm going to build a temple for the holy box, the Ark of the Covenant. I'm going to build a temple for the presence of God. All right, let's pause there a minute. Think about that. Good idea? I mean, what do you think? I mean, when you say, wow, David, that's ambitious, but you know what? That sounds like a great idea. Building a temple for God, building that place where people can worship and sacrifice, building that place as this kind of witness to the Holy One of Israel. David, man, that is an awesome idea. Here's the problem. How many times do we get an idea or we make a plan and we think, that's a great idea. That's an awesome idea. God ought to agree and ultimately bless my plan or idea. I mean, after all, it's a great idea. Who could say that's not a great idea to build a temple for the Lord, to get something better for God? Certainly, God ought to bless my idea or my plan. The trouble is, when we assume that God is going to bless our plans, things get risky. Nathan the prophet enters. David tells him his idea. And even Nathan the prophet falls into the trap of assuming. Nathan hears the plan, and he replies to the king, Hey, David, king, go ahead. Do whatever is in your mind, for the Lord is with you. He assumes that God is with him, and therefore he assumes that anything David comes up with has got to be a good God planned. You see, when we assume that God ought to bless our plans, we get into risky territory. That night, God visits Nathan the prophet and says, wait a minute, I got different plans. He says, but that same night the Lord said to Nathan, go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord has declared. Now, even though David's idea, and even though David's plan for a temple was a good idea, and even though ultimately it is a God idea, it's just not a God idea for David. You see, what's going on is there is a reverse of blessing. That is, David has the idea, David has the plan, and he wants God to say yes to it. What really needs to happen is we get good God ideas and we say yes to God's plan. And so God begins to unfold his plan for David. He says, listen, David, when you die and are buried with your ancestors, I'll raise up one of your descendants, your own offspring, and I'll make his kingdom strong. He is the one who will build a house, a temple for my name, and I will secure his royal throne forever. See, the idea, the plan, building a temple, not a bad one, certainly part of God's purposes, just not for David. He has a different idea for David. He has a different purpose for David. 
You see, David has to be a warrior king. He, he still has things to accomplish in defeating God's enemies. He still needs to expand the kingdom of Israel. He still needs to deal with one of his sons who ultimately tries to take the throne away from him. You see, there's stuff that David doesn't know, but God does. And David is just not in the right position at the right time to be the right person to build the temple. David may not see it, but God does. Maybe we can do it this way. Let, maybe we can all agree this morning that God is just smarter and knows more than David. As awesome as King David was, as great a king as he was, can't we just agree that God knows more than David? And if you can agree with that, I suspect you can look in the mirror and say, God also knows more than you do. You see, our plans, our ideas, aren't always in sync with God's purposes and God's plans for our individual lives. And so the challenge for us, the invitation for us, is not to come up simply with our own ideas and our own plans centered on us, but instead to join God's plans and God's direction. We need to make sure that any idea, any plan that we get is not just ours, but it actually is moving in the direction and the purposes that God has. And so Nathan the prophet speaks the word of the Lord to David. And he said, go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord has declared. Are you the one to build a house for me to live in? The answer is, no. David, no. Good idea. Great plan. Part of my purposes. Just not for you. You see, David, you've got different gifts. You've got, got different talents. You've got different opportunities that are going to come up in your life that you need to grab hold of that are in sync with my direction and my purposes. And so, David, you're not the guy that's going to build the temple. It's going to be your son, Solomon. Now, this isn't just an Old Testament experience. This isn't just an Old Testament kind of word for us. There's also a great word from the book of James. In the book of James, it says, Look here, you, uh, you who say, Today or tomorrow we're going to, to a certain town and we'll stay there a year. We'll, we'll do business there and make a profit. Good plan? Good idea? <laughs> Well, how do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, then it's gone. What you ought to say is this. If the Lord wants us to, we'll live and do this or do that. Otherwise, you're boasting about your own pretentious plans, and all such boasting is evil. What's the warning? When we focus in on just our ideas and our plans... We can absolutely miss the direction that God wants our life to go in. You see, I know right now that for many of you out there, especially with this pandemic going on, life is just not unfolding like you expected. You need to understand it doesn't mean God isn't working, and it doesn't mean that God doesn't still have a direction and a purpose for your life. And what we need to do in this time especially is to take some time and make sure we're moving in God's direction and not expecting God to do what we want. We're here to do what he wants. He gives that word to David. He says, listen, David, you're not going to build your house, but I'm going to be working and I'm going to build a house. Your house and your kingdom will continue before me for all time and your throne will will be secured forever. He makes a promise to David that says, David, listen, it's not about your ideas, it's not about your plans, it's about what I am doing and about what I am going to do. And as far as you're concerned, David, here's what you need to know. I'm going to secure your throne. And one of your descendants is going to sit upon that throne absolutely forever. 
Okay, right about now, you're probably sitting there saying, okay, Pastor, that's great stuff. That's great information this morning, but uh, I haven't heard anything about praying so far. You're right. Here it is. David gets that word, and his first response is to pray. You see, David understands. He needs to join what God is doing. He needs to make sure that his life is moving in the direction that God chooses for him. And so he starts his discernment by being in prayer. Where does he start? He starts in his prayer by just counting on God's presence. He just counts on God's presence. This is one of the best verses and experiences in the Bible. Now remember, this is King David. This isn't some slouch. This is King David who has consolidated his power in his throne. And what does he do? Then King David went in and sat before the Lord and prayed. He went in. Went in where? He went in the tent. The very thing that he thought was inadequate. He went into the tent. And he just sat before the Lord. He didn't come, a list with, uh, come in with a list of expectations. He didn't come in with a list of great ideas. He didn't come in with all kinds of spec speculation. He didn't come in with all kinds of expectations of what God ought to do for him in his life or what God ought to bless in his life. Instead, he simply started counting on the presence of God. He went in and he sat before the Lord. Isn't that awesome? I, you know, I can't tell you the number of times that, uh, you know, I've been in our incredible building here at Christ Church, and I just go into one of our worship rooms, and I just sit. I just sit. Not with any expectations, not with any agenda, but simply just to sit in the presence of the Lord. To give God every opportunity in those moments to speak into my life. You see, you can't discern the direction of God if you're not sitting in the presence of God. Did you hear that? There is just no way you can discern the, the action and direction of God if you're not taking the time to sit in the very presence of God. Well, I want to invite you to think about that. Think about where it is maybe in your house during this time of, you know, kind of sheltering and quarantining a bit. Think, think about that place maybe in your house where you can just go sit with the Lord. Maybe it's a place in your yard where you just go outside and you see the beauty around you and you just sit counting on the presence of the Lord. Now, one sub-note with this, it doesn't mean you go out and play golf. I've heard that a lot of times, and I'm just not buying it, right? When you're out playing golf, you're playing golf, okay? You're not sitting in the presence of the Lord. Go have fun, play golf, but find a time to just sit in the presence of the Lord. David sits, and as he sits, he approaches God and he approaches him in all humility. He focuses on God, not on himself. He says, who am I? Who am I? Again, David doesn't come in and sit in the presence of God and lay out all of his great plans and ideas and purposes and what God ought to agree with. He comes in empty. He just empties himself. Some of you need to do that. You need to sit in the presence of the Lord. And when you're sitting there, you just need to let go. Let go of some of the anxiety. Let go of some of the anxiousness. Let go of some of the worry in this time. Let go of some of the disappointments of plans that just simply didn't go the way you thought. To just let go of yourself. And understand there is someone at work in your life who is greater. And that's what happens with David. 
In David's prayers, he comes in, he sits in that presence of the Lord, he empties himself, reminding himself in all humility that he's dust, and then he counts on God's sovereignty. Did you hear it in the verse? He says, Who am I, O sovereign Lord? And what is my family that you have brought me this far? What does David do? Sitting in the presence of the Lord, absolutely emptying himself. He recognizes what he counts on is not himself, but the sovereign nature of Christ, the sovereign nature of God. He knows God is working. He knows God is in authority. He knows God has a future for him. He knows God is still in control for him and for his family. We're in a difficult time, but God is still working. We're in a challenging time, but God is still in control. We're in a difficult, challenging, never been there before moment. And yet God knows more than we do. He is out in front of us, and he is moving our lives according to his direction and his purposes. And we just sit in his presence, and we empty ourselves, and we just trust in his absolute sovereignty. That's what David does. He says, how great are you, O God? How great you are, O sovereign Lord. There is no one like you. We have never even heard of another God like you. That's who we have. That's who we trust. And so when we pray, we sit in that presence. We just empty ourselves, and we trust in God's sovereignty, and we hold on to God's promises. God makes a promise to David. He says, and now may it please you, David says, and now may it please you to bless the house of your servant so that it may continue forever before you. God makes this promise to David that one of his own is going to sit on the throne. And David just holds on to the promise. If it pleases you, God, if it pleases you, fulfill the promise, right? For you have spoken, you, Lord, your promises are true and good, and I can trust them. And the same is still true today. Because the promise that God spoke through Nathan the prophet to David is a promise fulfilled in Jesus. You see, we look at David's family and that throne, and we say, well, well wait a minute. Yeah, David ruled and died, and then Solomon took over, and yeah, he ruled and had one of the most prosperous of kingdoms. But after that, things fell apart. They went in the tank, and ultimately, Israel would carried off into exile. What about the promise? And the Bible tells us in Bethlehem, the city of David, a child was born who is of the house and the line of David. You see, God always fulfills his promises, and he made that promise to David, your house and your kingdom will continue before me for all time, and your throne will be secure forever. And in Jesus, his throne is secure, and your life is secure. Because he has built a new temple, a new temple raised to be in your every day. See, here's the great irony. Jesus, when he was a teaching rabbi, he went to Jerusalem and he went to the temple, the temple that was built. He went to the temple and he was teaching at the temple and he was doing miracles at the temple. And the Jewish leader says, oh my gosh, how could you do that? What gives you such authority? Do a miracle to prove who you are. And Jesus says, what? You want a miracle? Destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up again. And they said, destroy the temple, raise it up in three days. It's taken us 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to rebuild it in three days. Are you nuts? But when Jesus said this temple, he meant his own body. See, we have a temple. We have that very presence and power of God, and it's in our every day. It's working in our lives all the time in the person of Jesus. And so we can come before him 
and we can just sit in His presence. And we can empty ourselves and let go of all of our shame and let go of all of our guilt, let go of all of our failures and know the forgiveness that He won for us on a cross. We can trust in His sovereign nature that He is always working for our good. And we can hold on to His promise and know that they're true because three days later, after they destroyed His life, He rose again. And the disciples, they got it. They saw it. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remember what he had said, and they believed both the Scriptures and what Jesus said. I believe that today. I hope you believe that today. In the light of everything that's going on, you can just sit in the presence of Jesus. You can empty yourself, and you can just trust in his sovereignty that He is working for your good and the good of His people. And you can hold on to His promises and know that they are true and they will be fulfilled. And you can know that your life, while you may have to give up some of your own plans and some of your own ideas, that your life can join the direction of God's purposes. And when you do that, you will impact people one heart at a time for the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Father, thank you that uh, you give us the experience of David today to see his life unfold and to uh, just enter into his prayer. And we pray that it would be an opportunity for us to enter into that same experience. Just sit in your presence. Just uh, know that you are good and gracious and loving and that you have sovereign plans for our life and that we can hold on to those promises and you will fulfill all things according to your word. And so, Lord, we come to you today And we ask, reveal to us your plans. Make clear to us your direction. Especially in this time of challenge, give us hope that we can join you in a new future. We ask it and pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the promises that we receive through Scripture and through prayer is that God is faithful and just and merciful and forgives us of our wrongdoing. But we lean on the words that come to us in the first letter of John that says, if we claim that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But God, who is merciful and just, will cleanse us from all unrighteousness when we confess our sins. And so we're going to take a moment now to confess the ways that we've turned our backs on our neighbors and on God. So I ask you to join me now in a moment of silence as we lift um, our confessions to God. Have heart, take hope. We know that the promise of the cross and the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is that our sins do not weigh us down. They do not burden us forever. That God in his mercy has already chosen to forgive our sins now and forever. So know that as you go into the world that you are free, that you are not burdened by what you have done in your past and that this promise is true and it is for you. I ask you now to join me in the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today at Christ Church. Thank you for worshiping with us and being in community with us. The band is going to send us out with one more song, and I hope that you sing along with them. In my wrestling and in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. In the silence, you won't let go. In the questions, your truth will hold. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness. I will follow you, oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse. I will trust the promise. You will carry me safe to shore. Have a great week and come back and see us next time. Bye.